Are we live? There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the final No Name Reading Series at UNL for the graduate students of the English department. Um, final as in final for this year. So if you are interested in coordinating, helping us run this um, adventure, just reach out to me or Jess or Jamaica or Jonathan, and we would love to um, have your help. We just have three readers tonight, and I'm very excited about them. Um, so we'll get started. Um, our first reader is David Hinson, and he sometimes publishes stories under his own name and sometimes records songs under the name Shadows on a River. And he's going to be reading fiction tonight. Welcome, David. Thanks. Uh, all right, this is weird. I don't know if anyone's out there, so it feels strange. Um, this is uh, technically a fiction, a piece of fiction. Uh, it's, it's a list is essentially what it is, a list of things not to do. And maybe I won't explain it any more than that. Um, all right, it's called... Control impulse delete. Don't explain yourself to anyone. Don't write it down. Don't water it down. Don't lose yourself in translation. Don't stoop to kiss your own shadow. Don't feel the hot concrete on your knees. Don't nudge the dog out of the way to kiss your shadow's wavering neck. Don't tie the bag off and throw it at the church. Don't stand with eyes closed, breathing the sound of bells. Don't wait to get caught. Don't Dostoevsky, don't plot. Don't shake your naked soul like an empty sock puppet. Don't talk to anyone but God. Don't see anyone but God. Don't run your fingers between the middle blinds. Don't imagine the moon's position in the sky. Don't breathe if you can help it. Don't doubt, don't be stupid and try. Don't write an autobiographical novel. Don't assume your lust is unique or worthwhile. Don't make your life a story. Don't acknowledge beginnings or endings. Don't be clever. Don't be cute. Don't talk to anyone but God. Don't see anyone but God. Don't argue. Don't pick sides. Be sideless. Don't choose a body. Don't support a body. Don't seek out a body. Don't rely on your own body or the body of anyone else. Don't forget to include some sense of nature. Don't forget the kind of green that means water and eternity, green that holds. Don't forget your audience. Don't struggle. Don't forget about ease. Don't call anyone past midnight, past drink number four, past the point of no return. Don't put yourself out there. Don't believe in the past. Don't judge so you never have to forgive. Don't trust the images in your head if you've seen them, if you've seen them before. Don't string together some unplayable movie behind your eyes. Don't star in a tragedy no one will ever see. Don't give interviews to Terry Gross in the shower. Don't reveal it all unless it's to show you were never anything to begin with. Don't tell me you don't remember. Don't come undone. There's nothing holding you together. Don't think they're talking to you even when they're talking to you. Don't think about them. They don't think about you. Don't forget about the freedom in that. Don't concentrate, don't force a thought. Receive thoughts like water poured into glass, hold water like a riverbed. Don't keep receipts, don't touch receipts. Don't make meaning of numbers on paper. Don't count your blessings. Don't perpetuate anything your parents told you. Don't divide the world. Pretend your opinions are contagious. Don't offer them to anyone. Don't pretend that loving is something you can do. People perform, love emanates. Don't resist, capitulate, surrender, stand up the white flag, play dead if you want to live. Don't assume I'm talking to you. Don't calculate, don't predict, don't follow anyone into dark rooms meant for spirits. Don't misinterpret, don't interpret, don't turn up the tape full blast and listen for hidden voices. Don't hear anything other than what I say. Don't talk to anyone but God. Don't see anyone but God. Don't call them friends. Don't wait for the call. Don't worry about forgetting birthdays. 
Don't make expectation your master. Don't check in, don't probe for disturbances. Don't interpret the feeling filling the car. Don't ask if it's okay if you don't know what it's like to be okay. Don't agree with the assessment. Don't laugh at the joke. Don't shatter a perfectly good quiet. Don't see anyone. Don't God. That's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, and thanks for including me in this reading. I hope you're all well. It's, it's good to almost see all of you. Thanks. Katie, I think you're muted. Thank you, David. Um, good, because what I said wasn't important or cool. Um, a few things to the readers. If you go to the comments section, you can see who's here. Um, I just want to point that out because David felt like he was adrift amidst a lonely sea. Um, all right, our next reader. Um, Jess Poli is the author of four chapbooks and co-editor of the collection More in Time, a tribute to Ted Kuzer. She's a PhD student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the founder and editor of Bird Feast and the poetry editor of Prairie Schooner. Thank you, Jess. I think she will be reading poetry. Thank you, Katie. I will be reading poetry. Um, I'm actually doing this crazy thing um, and and um, uh, doing the Poem a Day challenge in April, which is the first time I've ever done it. So I thought that I would read some new poems tonight. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I know it's like really gorgeous outside in Lincoln. So, you know, we all appreciate it. Um, this first poem is, the, the title of the poem comes from something um, a farmer I, I used to work for always said um, anytime he had like a toothache or um, his foot hurt or, or anything. Um, it's called, At Least It's Far From My Heart, is what the farmer said about the leg that was giving him trouble, arthritis maybe, or an old injury from God knows what a horse's kick, a run-in with a trailer hitch, a gate closed too quick. There are so many ways to get hurt in this work is what I'm saying. For example, the neighbor who lost his finger to a wood splitter or the one whose sleeve got stuck in an auger while digging a hole. And then there are all the bent-kneed middle-aged men climbing carefully down from tractor cabs, walking to their houses for dinner, hunched over, their limbs growing stiffer each day. But the heart is the thing that matters most. And was it this farmer's father or another's who was found in a silo he'd been cleaning after his had suddenly given up? Whoever he was, he'd been young, no more than 60, although it's likely he looked older from all the hot months spent haying fields and moving cattle, sun exhausted and sore. And now I think about these men mapping out their injuries counting the inches between the wound and the muscle pumping at their core, that great provider, how they might place a calloused hand over their chest at the end of a long day, just hoping for more. Future history. In the driveway, we look at the moon through the telescope that he carries from the cobwebbed garage. It's late. He speaks around a cigarette, narrating the lunar scape, its mountains and valleys, while I press my eye to the lens. He's careful not to touch me, even though only minutes ago, I was wrapped around him, the darkness of his bedroom, like the sky surrounding the moon. Afterwards, we look at a nebula, a streak of red and white dust. How old is that light, I wonder, but don't ask because I'm thinking of the light between us, trying to pin down the point at which it will go out. Uh, this next poem, it's, it's the only one I'm reading that's a little bit older. Um, and one warning is there is some uh, description of animal death in it. So if that's not your thing, just 
cut out for a minute. Um, this is called Balm. It's morning and in my arms another lamb is dying. I've done this before. Watched a horse bloated and belly up jerk its legs in its stall before the vet came with her needle to soothe it. But here, this small shaking body seems like a bigger death. Her short breath on my neck, the stain of yellow-green shit soaking the center of my shirt from where her back legs press. Maybe I'm making too much of the way her eyes close as she finishes the bottle of milk, how her head falls against my chest as if to say, I trust you as much as one animal can trust another. If love were ingestible, wouldn't it take the form of milk warm from a mother's teat? This milk is from a goat, but the lamb would never know, being the runt of the litter, kicked away by her own mother's sharp hoof. With what tangible vessel of love can I nurse her? And here I'll admit that in my head, I'm already writing this poem, have already arrived at the image of the shit blooming on my shirt like a flower or a patch of green lichen. And I've looked at her throat and thought about how I would cut it if I had to, if her suffering grew larger than what her body could contain, have watched videos on how to do it. And now holding her, I picture bright droplets of blood scattered on the pine chips below us. And I know, I'm ashamed to say it, that it would be beautiful. What could help? A freshly sharpened pencil. At any given moment, a glass of water, probably. Cleaning the rooms of dust and sickness. A baking soda paste for tough splinters. A helmet, knee pads, armor. Less obvious, tomatoes picked fresh from the vine, hot from the sun. Sugar coat, lime a jar of pickled peaches. A piano might help to settle my nervous fingers. More plants would purify the air in the house. The fern keeps dropping more leaves and I'm not sure what it wants, more water or less. And anyhow, how to stop wanting all the time. Right now, I want salt and vinegar chips and someone to kiss me with tongue. More money would solve a lot of my problems. For spring to come and the windows to open would take care of some others. Sometimes I think the answer is yoga and lavender kombucha. Others, it's sleeping all day and eating Taco Bell for dinner. Today, it's the spiral of my cat's tail, the way his cheeks puff out when he snores, the fact that in this poem, he'll never die. The best part about reading that is that I, I, all I can hear right now is my cat snoring on the couch. Um, I doubt you all can hear it, but um, that is what, in fact, what he's doing right now. Um, <laughs> uh, this is another new poem. This is called The Lost Poems. I wrote a poem while I was driving, but I got lost on my way back to it. I wrote a poem in the shower, but it washed away with the soap. I wrote a poem in my dream, but a whale ate it. I wrote a poem while walking, but a dog chased it away. I wrote a poem about leaving, but then I stayed. I wrote a poem about memory, but I got, but I got everything wrong. I wrote a poem at the lake, but the wind fed it to the gulls. I wrote many poems about love, but it didn't change anything. I wrote a poem in my head, but I forgot it except for one line. When you left, the house shook, then sank. Um, and I just have one more poem to read. Um, this one is about the Sandhill crane migration that comes through Nebraska every year. Um, if you haven't seen it and you live in Nebraska, then I highly recommend it. Um, I got to go out there with my friend Briar about a month ago, I think. And uh, I had seen it before, but not in the morning. And so we got up really early and, and drove out there and, and got to, we got there about five minutes before they all kind of lifted off all at once. And it was an incredibly emotional experience. 
So here is this poem. Sandhill Crane Migration, Kearney, Nebraska. No, this was not the edge of the world, though I thought it might be. Cranes lifting off the wide, silty river in a huge mass, churning, shifting as the light shifted, the sun making its slow way to the water. I didn't expect the tears that came, or not the tears themselves, but the reason for them, this witnessing of birds' bodies huddled together warmly on the water and flying in close lines along the horizon, a sight which suddenly raised a wild jealousy in me. To be close to that many bodies, to feel someone else's strong wing brush against your soft underbelly. I wanted that. I wanted to be jostled in line at the grocery store, waiting to buy milk and peanut butter, to get lost in a sweaty crowd at the bourbon, listening to a band that only knew four songs. No, this wasn't the edge of the world, but it felt like we'd been coming to it again and again for the last year, getting closer to the sharp edge of ourselves, that place where we can stand no more, where there's an audible snap, and then all the grief floods in. The water was low on the river. Before I left, I stared at it, moving across the silt that gathered around the bridge's piers. Two cranes flew overhead and called out, and the sound echoed in me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. Um, just getting a little choked up over here. Um, our last reader, Katie Schmid, um, is a poet, and her collection of poems, Nowhere, is forthcoming this August from the University of New Mexico Press. And I'm so excited for it and excited to hear her read. It feels like it's been a long time. So welcome, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Thank you um, to Jamaica and Katie and to Jess Poli. Um, also, so beautiful. Um, that reading was so lovely. And um, David Henson, too. Writers are the best kinds of people um, because they feel so deeply and then they report back from those really big, deep feelings. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, my first poem is called Apartment Hunting. My mother is getting priced out of the one bedroom she hoped would be mine someday. And my parents have bought an RV to live in once my stepmom retires. And the residents of Hong Kong coffin rooms go to sleep sealed in 12 square feet. And I'm trying to think of something to say to terror, to lack. I know my job, and I know I don't have Ruckheiser's song. I don't have Clifton's brain. I have debt. I have the thin morning settled in a film over my body, the impoverished thinking of panic. The day gets so thin in the blue bare hour of dread. The day gets so threadbare from worrying, and I am shamed by how I long for the lush safety of money. The debt of my life is owed and owed and owed again, many times over to what suffers because of me. I meant to say who. I say it now, who. The nothing I know could sate a thousand hungers. Who. I call you in from the large capacious rooms of your pain. The God of suffering has laid down her guilt cloak and attends to you. I use this remaining space for my silence that she might fill the world with listening. Uh, this one's called The Mary Jar and it's got um, an epigraph from the Litany of Laredo, um, which is about, um, I believe about the Virgin Mary, although I'm not actually Catholic, so I'm sort of stealing this. Um, and the epigraph is spiritual vessel, vessel of honor singular vessel of devotion. 
They told me a girl steals your beauty, but before she was born, I dreamed my daughter held the intricate lattice of my body and would return my beauty to me, refined in her many eyes. All that honey, all the rough sugar, those networks of hidey holes in darkness where she crouched and labored to build herself. I see my mistake now. It is not Margot's job to store my worth. I don't know why I am most myself when I am giving my body away like bread to sop up the last bit of sauce on the plate, indolent and sheened with love sweat, draped like a little doll over some man's wet mess, or just that merry jar, little space where God is brewed into a holy liquor, my body made visible by committee, the cabinet of gruff voices who anoint all vessels. But what of what's left? My sugar, my rot, my empty, mysterious lace. And what of my daughter and her 500 eyes, all trained on my will, as I strain to erect the edifice of my public face once more? Um, this one's called Pretend. Um, and it's got an epigraph from a poem by Stephen Freck. The poem is called The Dark Villages of Childhood. Um, and uh, the epigraph is a brilliant and dangerous game pretending to be what one is. Everyone I know is hoping they'll survive their childhoods, even though their childhoods are 30 years old by now. The door I locked isn't foolproof because I am the fool who locked it. A fog seeps out of the keyhole, bearing a fragrance. That's all childhood is. Vapors of licked pennies, the smell of old book plates, the hot air in the room where you knew for the first time that you were damned to hell. I watch you fill with rage like a demented windsock man from a used car lot. Your father's rage has come for you, traveling those many decades toward you. I watch myself from beside my body in dread. There's no hope for her. Hauntings, cravings, the smell of burnt cookies in the air from the moment he left me three decades ago. Who's to say it's not the same air? We'll have to let it caram through our bodies and come out the top. We'll have to try it on for size, see how it fits. The scared air Margot breathes is the scared air I breathed in my childhood room alone. She is only pretending to be scared, but to her, pretending is what is. How about you be Anna and I be Elsa? Okay. How about you be a bear and I be a wolf? Okay. How about you be a mama and I be a little kid? Okay, okay, okay. This one's called um, The Holiness of Degradation and I, I can't take credit for that title because it's a, a title, that the, the title is from a line by Leslie uh, Jamison and um, there's a, another line in here from that same piece. It was um, a really beautiful article that she wrote about, <laughs> um, gosh, now it's hard for me to remember, like women's um, abjection, I guess. Um, and it's a really beautiful piece, a really beautiful essay. The Holiness of Degradation. Anne says, what if you are not sick or bad? What if you are Katie? I know I have to fuck the stories that are fucking me. I think about the writer who spoke of despair that remains curious about the world, thirsty for justice and company, and what it would mean to keep myself company in this hateful hour. Accompany myself into hell, knowing that even in hell there is singing, the most beautiful singing. My dog noses over my body to find a warm, pained spot for her cold nose. It is dark tonight. 
Many hours of the night await me. It will not be enough to be good, Katie. You must be something you haven't created yet. To think you know anything of what you are is a laugh. To think you know anything. Like sitting in a Quaker meeting house and wishing Sylvia would shut the fuck up. And then you wake up into your mind and realize Sylvia is holding the oars that are rowing you to God. And God's universe is thick with the good black rot that means something will grow again. If you can only stay with me here, don't leave. This moment is safe if we don't think about the next. This holy room Sylvia let me into before she died and took the oars with her. I'm trying to stay in the boat though I am beside myself. I am trying to be beside myself. Look, she doesn't have enough strength yet, but the boat is big enough for two. The boat is patient for what it wants. Holy nothing, rolling forever. Her arms are not strong enough for oars, but she'll try her voice and see where that takes her. Um, this one is called uh, Questionnaire to Determine the Perimeter and Use of the Wound. Are you whole or are you a whole? If a whole, what kind? One you can disappear into? Tell us. One that you will spend your life crawling out of? Tell us. Consider to what use you might put the whole. Can it be mined? Can it be described? Will language adhere? Tell us. How might the whole be made to work? It is important that you know there could be scholarship money in it. If you keep the narrative between 200 to 500 words and our committee finds it a moving depiction of hardship. I want to say you can't have me. I want to pronounce me mine with my eternal silence. Instead, I betray myself. I open my mouth and begin to speak. Um, this one's called Rules of Engagement. Do you remember that fight we had when we were drunk and 20 years old? You tried to apologize by wearing a funny tie, and when I wouldn't look at you, you threw it in the yard like a real housewife of Decatur, Illinois. Back then, it felt like the least push could break it, but that fight didn't, and the 20 fights after it didn't either. In the bathroom brushing our teeth at 7 a.m. last week, you told me that some of the weird internet mystics say people we're heavily entangled with in this life are people we've traveled with before in other times. You are talking in that way you have, to gentle me like a nervous dog, more than to impart any information. It was so early that I missed the point and began to cry, thinking of us as mother and daughter, as lovers, as pet and owner, as rivals for the hand of the same woman. I knew you. I know you now. I'll never know you. Not until we're done traveling together under many names. We have a few lifetimes left to go. We're getting better at the fight we have, the one about who is right. A few years ago, we learned how to stop trying to win. Now we're working on the part of fear that drops us into a dark room alone. I feel the net stretch to hold us where we're scared. We call the fight, come back to me. We call the net, the holy yes. Um, I've got two more. Uh, this one's called terrarium. My mother taught me to give kisses and hugs to relatives, their prize for being old and having lived to an ancient decade, multitude kisses from children unwillingly given. A kiss could be a gift something you gave in exchange for a gift, a party favor, something someone deserved, slick little sick harvest. I like to think I know better. I like to think when my nephew refuses to kiss me, I'm gracious about it, that I know his body's not for me. 
but I do crave the small wealth of his free affection. And I've lied. I've told men and women I wanted them out of deference, out of some sense of benign kindness, ignoring the sacred locks of my body's dam in my rush to please. I had so many years to be kind to myself. I have so few years to be kind to myself. So I am not better, even if I know better. What good is knowing if it doesn't live in the body? The sun is my mother and I feed on her, drugged with her milk and the nascent snake of a girl flips inside me. What I am looking for in my orbit of the myriad small rooms of my life is what comes after knowledge. I am looking for the wealth of my body to wade into the spring and find it depthless, a passage to another world, if I but had the breath and nerve. This last one's called The Broken Knot. My best art is longing. I walked the fields of the years, casting my heart forward like a net and drew what luck I could back to me. In the fields were fathers, houses, front porches, not mine. I learned to possess the distance between my body and theirs. The net of my heart was full of holes and let out everything it caught. I thought one day I might learn to repair the net, catch whatever roams and make it mine. But as I walked, I saw I could no longer envy those with better nets and what wanted to be lost would stay lost out of fear or illness or some secret I couldn't know. What is mine is the net, broken though it is, mine. Arms empty, the chasm of space between me and safety, mine. I put my best art to rest. I shut the door on the wild expanse of want. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, thank you everyone for coming and for joining us this whole season of No Name. We'll see you next year and get in touch with us if you want to help out. Have a good night.